Start recording. Yeah. Okay, then I think we can start. And uh, we're very happy today that we have Marco Cirelli as a speaker. Marco completed his PhD at the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa and then held uh, postdoctoral positions in Yale and Saclay in Paris. And then he was appointed as a researcher in the CNRS in France. And he's now uh, working as a CNRS research director in uh, LPTHE, which is located in the Sorbonne University in Paris. And he was also the recipient of a prestigious uh, year C starting grant a few years ago. And uh, Marco, please take it away when you want. Okay, thank you very much, Davide. Thanks for the, for the introduction. Uh, indeed, so I'm going to talk to you about uh, dark matter in direct searches. Uh, and uh, let's say that my ambition is to get to the status of these searches, uh, searches for dark matter via the indirect way, as of, uh, say, this year, with a sort of summary at the end, if I can get to it. Now, of course, it, I, I cannot touch upon everything, so I have uh, prepared something which is uh, rather basic and, uh, and introductory, and I will discuss only a few selected topics uh, in uh, dark matter indirect searches. But anyway, feel free to interrupt me. I don't need to cover all the material, and I can select uh, things uh, as, we, as we move on. So uh, we are looking for dark matter, so I will not give you an introduction about dark matter because it's uh, otherwise too boring for everyone. I will just say that in a few words that dark matter exists because of this, this, and this. And I'm not going to discuss this uh, any longer. And I'm also going to say that dark matter is a neutral, very long-lived and feebly interacting corpuscule. These are sort of facts uh, that we cherish as established in some sense. So when, when, I, when I write corpuscule, I mean something that behaves like matter in cosmology. So something whose density uh, dilutes as one over the volume of the universe as the universe expands. So something which has the characteristics of some corpuscular matter. It doesn't mean necessarily a particle, and it doesn't mean this feebly interacting here doesn't necessarily mean that it's interacting with the weak interactions of the standard model. On the other hand, uh, as you certainly know, one of the most uh, um, say established paradigms, not necessarily true, is that dark matter could be a new fundamental elementary particle, elementary composite, but a particle, an elementary particle, that interact, interacts weakly in the sense of the SU2 left of the standard model. And why is that? Essentially because some of us, a good portion of the community, maybe fewer and fewer, but uh, in the past decades, uh, uh, most of the community believe in the so-called will to miracle, which is nothing but the statement that uh, a mass, a particle with a, with a mass at the order of the weak scale, so say in this range, take, give or take an order of magnitude, and with weak interactions, and now again, uh, in the sense of the SU2 left of the standard model, has a annihilation cross-section uh, uh, in the early universe uh, given by this magic number here, 3 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second, which gives automatically the correct relic abundance. So if you throw in a particle in the thermal buff of the early universe with these characteristics, what you get is the final relic abundance that we observe in the universe uh, today. So that's uh, the sort of framework inside which most of the indirect detection searches have moved in the past, uh, say, 50 years or so. And indeed, uh, we have been focusing on this uh, part of the parameter space in terms of uh, dark matter candidates around the a mass of uh, one TV, say around the, the weak scale, which is where thermal particles in the sense of what I just discussed of the thermal production in the early universe uh, live. But as you know very well, this is just a tiny portion of the, of, the, of the possible parameter space, which goes over 90 orders of magnitude or so between say ultralight scalars at 10 to the minus 21 electron volts up to uh, primordial black holes, which have masses of uh, even larger than the, the, the solar mass. So indirect searches have started or were born around this regime here of thermal particles, and I will mostly focus on this still, but they can be used to look for also, say, sterile neutrinos or primordial black holes or sub-GV dark matter or other kinds of particles which are not necessarily around the weak scale, and which are not necessarily produced with a thermal uh, freeze-out mechanism. Now, we're talking about uh, trying to detect dark matter, and indeed, we are trying to detect it in the sort of, uh, in the, the way called the indirect, uh, in, in the indirect way. 
which essentially means looking for the annihilations or the decay of dark matter particles in the galactic halo or even beyond. So looking for the subproducts of the annihilations of two dark matter particles in the galactic halo as they reach us, our telescope or our satellites uh, from uh, where they are produced in the, in the galaxy. So I will try to go through this uh, uh, species of subproducts that we can look for, say antiprotons, positrons, gamma rays, antinuclei, light antinuclei. And I will probably skip neutrinos because there's nothing really new on, uh, on this and it's, uh, it's a bit the, the easiest of these possible searches. So let me start with the charged particles, uh, antiprotons and positrons, and then move on uh, possibly to the, other, to the other species. And we'll actually start with antiprotons, using them as a sort of uh, warm-up exercise to give you the basics of what we are doing. So the basic picture is the following. So we are here in the galaxy, and uh, we are somewhere 8.5 kiloparsecs away from the galactic center. This is just the position, uh, the position of the sun. And we are immersed, uh, as we know from uh, astrophysics, cosmology, and uh, rotation curves in particular, inside a, a blob, a halo of dark matter particles that surrounds the galaxy and which has a, a certain density profile, uh, which is denser at the center and uh, uh, less dense as they move to the periphery of the galaxy. So every now and then in this uh, dark matter halo, two dark matter particles find each other and provided that they are uh, the antiparticle of each other or that they meet between particle and antiparticle of dark matter, they can annihilate exactly as they were doing in the, in the early universe, producing uh, um, ordinary particles such as, for instance, uh, a, a pair of a proton and antiproton or a pair of a, an electron and a positron and uh, everything else. So I always talk about antimatter here. So I will focus on antiprotons, I will focus on positrons and possibly later on antideuterium and so on, just because, uh, not because there is an asymmetry in the production mechanism, but typically the, the production is symmetric, but because antimatter is less abundant in the, in the galaxy from astrophysical processes. And so it's easier to look for it, right? So this is a, a basic, a basic uh, fact. So the production process uh, here happens everywhere in the galactic halo, and indeed uh, it annihilates uh, particles of dark matter to produce standard model particles, such as the antimatter particles uh, charge, charge uh, cosmic rays that I was mentioning a, a second ago. So the production is very, is very simple to model in some sense, uh, and uh, in a model independent way is a model in the following, in the following way. We assume that there is a, a pair of dark matter particles annihilating in some way, into two primary channels, which could be W plus W minus, BB bar, or plus or minus, or whatever. And then these primary particles, uh, which are standard model particles, uh, annihilate, um, decay, do their parton showering, uh, their, uh, their hadronization, and uh, whatever they have to do, until we get to the final products, uh, which are the only stable particles that can propagate uh, around uh, in the galactic halo. So basically, the new physics uh, which governs uh, how dark matter behaves and how it interacts with standard model particles is, is hidden in this blob here. And typically, your model will predict uh, a given cross-section for this process or a given uh, um, branching ratios for the different primary channels that you, that you consider. Once you get to the right of this uh, step here, so from the primary channels on, this is just standard model physics, basically. So you have to model it uh, with standard model Monte Carlo uh, codes, such as Pythia or Hervig uh, or others, and you get to the final products in terms of fluxes of positrons, antiprotons, uh, possibly antideuterium, and so on and so forth. So here are the examples. What you get, are, let's look at, for instance, the fluxes of antiprotons, because we were looking into that. So these are the fluxes of antiprotons com protons coming from uh, a particle with a mass of, a cloud of uh, one TV dark matter particle and mass of one TV, annihilating into different primary channels, which are given by this uh, legend around here. So you see that uh, the shape is, in some sense, determined by the primary channel that you choose. And uh, the, the main characteristics are instead uh, given by the uh, particle physics models, of, particle physics parameters of the dark matter. So the end point of the spectrum is given by the mass of dark matter here. And the normalization of the spectrum is given by the annihilation cross-section, so how much of the total spectrum number of particles per decade of uh, fractional kinetic energy K you get in, in, the final, in the final result. 
So all this comes out essentially from running a, a huge um, Monte Carlo codes with Pythia and collecting histograms that then uh, you uh, simplify and sort of smooth into these uh, uh, interpolating functions. Just notice a, a sort of out of a curiosity that uh, there is a process uh, which, is, uh, which has to be taken into account and which was not taken into account uh, until a few years ago, which are electroweak corrections. So basically the fact that uh, these primary channels, when they are produced before decaying and going into their final products, uh, can radiate an electroweak boson, so a gamma or a Z or a W, and these particles will then hadronize, sorry, um, decay, uh, shower and hadronize as they are supposed to do in the standard model. And this extra emission, say of a Z, for instance, which can be attached to the, to the leg of the primary channels is important because you get something which otherwise you wouldn't get in the, more, in the more naive approximation. For instance, you can get antiprotons from a purely leptonic annihilation into E plus E minus. So you see that you annihilate into E plus E minus the green solid line, and indeed you get some antiprotons because the, what happened is that the E plus E minus before flying away in the universe, say, have radiated the Z and the Z had decayed into hadrons, into yes, quarks and then hadrons that have produced the antiprotons. And similarly for the spectrum of uh, positrons on the other side. So all of this you can do and Let's take a, a bit of a distance. And I was saying, uh, as I was saying, uh, the, the fluxes have uh, a very clear, uh, say, uh, shape, uh, overall shape, uh, which is the following one. So they have a sort of bell shaped uh, bump uh, that you are. Sorry, going to uh, Marco, yeah. I, I have a, I'm an outsider to this field. So I have a quick question. Sure. Why, what is the basic mechanism that says E plus E minus is not primary? Like what determines? what particle goes in the primary channel and not in no, the No, no, so here, here it's just a shorthand. So let's say here the primary channel uh, contains all the possible standard model particles. So actually E plus E minus should also be here. If this okay. is what you mean. Yeah, yeah so yeah. Okay. the primary channels are all the uh, pairs of particles, antiparticles of the standard model. So you have uh, all the leptons, all the quarks uh, and, all the, okay. uh, and all the gauge bosons and the Higgs boson, right? So everything. It's just okay, a, so you just haven't just written the e plus e minus there. exactly okay. i haven't written e plus e minus but i'm actually using to this example for this example that i just mentioned so indeed suppose that the primary channel that you have is e plus e minus so they annihilate directly into e plus e minus mm -hmm. then what you would expect is to have as final products just e plus e minus with an energy which is delta function right so mm -hmm. you expect mm -hmm. that the dark matter goes into e plus e minus and they fly away that with that the total energy given by dark matter interrupt uh, demarcation and then instead what happens is that this delta and the delta function is smeared and has a lower bump at lower energies and this is the effect of electroweak corrections right okay so i was using this example without explicitly writing here that e plus e minus is a possible other primary channel by the way so i wrote these channels here because the feeling is that uh, typically dark matter, not typical, but let's say in most models, uh, dark matter particles will annihilate tentatively more into heavier particles. So that's why I'm putting B and tau and the gauge bosons uh, rather than electrons and neutrinos. Uh, this has to do with the typically uh, helicity suppression and other things, but I mean, it's not particularly important. It depends on the model. All primary channels can be all standard model particles. Okay, thank you. So uh, I was saying that indeed uh, the, the, the basic picture, let's say if you want, is that uh, you, we are looking for a bump, an excess in uh, antiprotons or positrons on top of uh, a background that comes from astrophysics. And as I, as I said already, the, the, the features that we are looking for are rather clear. Uh, the dark matter mass gives uh, the end point of the spectrum, so a rather sharp cutoff at the mass of dark matter. Also, I forgot to say that dark matter particles are supposed to be actually are essentially non relativistic in the halo. And so they have no kinetic energy. And so all the energy is in the mass that they have, which goes into the energy of the produced cosmic rays. The primary channels, so the choice of the primary channels or a combination of those determines the shape of this bell, rather hard or rather soft, depending on what we saw uh, before. 
And of course, the annihilation cross section. So how often uh, these dark matter particles uh, annihilate? Uh, how which how much of a probability? How large of a probability determines the total normalization of how many flux, how much flux, how many particles uh, you you get. Good, but this is so this at this level this is rather clean. It's just standard model physics plus the unknown uh, dark matter physics. But then, uh, unfortunately, astrophysics uh, gets into the way in the sense that uh, these particles, which are produced this at this point, uh, charge cosmic rays, anti protons, positrons, and so on, which are produced everywhere in the galactic halo, have to propagate around the galaxy before they can get to us, to our satellites or telescopes. And while they do that, they go through the galactic environment with all its uh, its complications. So, for instance, uh, they spiral around in the galactic uh, mag magnetic field, and so they lose energy by synchrotron radiation and, uh, and possibly other processes. They are blown away by the uh, wind of uh, cosmic rays coming from the galactic disk where stars are. And so in some cases, they can be blown away outside of the galaxy, or they can annihilate against the protons, if we are talking about, pro about anti-protons, and so on and so forth. They can traverse the cosmic, they can cross the cosmic, the, um, the galactic disk and so suffer shocks, which uh, may remove them from the flux or actually can accelerate them over on, um, on, um, in the spectrum if they meet a hot uh, gas region and, and so on and so forth. And finally, they have to penetrate the heliosphere, which is the sphere of the galactic, of the solar magnetic field and the solar wind when if they manage to do that, they get inside the let's say, a telescope or a satellite an orbit, on orbit around the Earth. So all of this is uh, rather complicated, and it is a sort of uh, uh, handled in an effective way in, in the following way. So you, you can either uh, model uh, the propagation by numerical uh, tools, uh, such as, for instance, uh, Galprop, which has been developed uh, not far from where you are, or you can try a semi-analytic principle. In the end, the results are not so different by solving this diffusion loss equation, which I wrote down here, inside a volume, which is depicted here. So a sort of tuna can uh, that encapsulates uh, the, the galaxy with the size L, actually 2L, and a radius which encapsulates the galaxy. So typically 20 kiloparsecs from one side to 40 kiloparsecs in, in diameter. So this diffusion loss equation, which is written here, tells you how the spectrum, so the F, the dn over dE of, uh, say, positrons or antiprotons, behaves as they propagate around the galaxy uh, under all the uh, processes that you just uh, sketched. So indeed, you have a term for diffusion equation for diffusion in the galactic magnetic fields, which is uh, here, of which the coefficient depends on the density and uh, and uh, strength and distribution of the magnetic field. If we, a term for energy losses, for instance, by inverse Compton or Bremsstrahlung or synchrotron radiation and so on. A term for the convective winds, this one here. A term for the spallations on uh, the density of gas in the, in the disk, which is, which is concentrated at Z equals zero here in the middle. And of course, an injection, a term for the, for the injection, which is, the, um, the, the production, the initial production due to the annihilation or possibly decay of dark matter particles. So the idea is to solve this diffusion loss equation with uh, different parameters inside this volume, which is uh, in some sense uh, the volume inside which uh, we believe uh, that uh, the dark map, the, the galactic magnetic field keeps uh, the charge cosmic rays confined. So the idea is that as long as the charge cosmic rays or the transanti protons propagate around this cylinder in a sort of random walk subject to all these processes, they stay inside because the magnetic field is such that the gyroscopic radius is smaller than the size of the, of the box. As they get to do the edges, instead they fly away. We assume that the galactic field goes to zero, say, and they fly away freely outside of the galaxy and will never uh, recover them. So this is a sort of simplified assumption, simplified uh, treatment that, however, works rather well for predicting signals of uh, dark matter cosmic rays uh, from, uh, from, from the galaxy. But of course, you understand that uh, there are so many astrophysical parameters uh, inside this equation here. 
and they depend and the propagation then will depend a lot on the values and the assumptions that they take for these astrophysical parameters. In particular, the simplest one to think about is the size of this box here. So the size L, the thickness of the, of the, of the tuna can box. So you need to understand that if this box is very thick, so maybe taller than wider, say, then you, the cosmic rays will be trapped inside the box for much longer. And so they will have more chances to get to, the, uh, to their detection at the, at the Earth. And so large L, thick box, will mean a lot of flux at the end collected. If instead the box, the box is very thin, then you will have a lot of leaks from the edges of the box and you will collect much less uh, flux of uh, charged cosmic rays. So the idea is that uh, we, has, we have to uh, determine the, the different values for these parameters here from ordinary cosmic ray physics, and then apply those to the dark matter case and uh, sort of uh, determine the fluxes that we get based on um, uh, say plausible intervals for the different parameters determined uh, from ordinary cosmic ray physics. This is typically done by choosing uh, Sets, sets of parameters uh, which, are the, which are written here. So the most important ones, uh, such as, for instance, the size of the box uh, or the coefficient of the diffusion coefficient, uh, the, the exponent of the diffusion coefficient, and these other uh, parameters in which I'm not, I don't want to go into details. And choosing the <clears throat> possible bracketing values uh, that are in agreement with uh, ordinary cosmic ray physics and that gives you the sort of range inside which the uncertainty, the theory uncertainty related to the propagation uh, should lie. So this is a whole industry that goes on from uh, 20 years or, or more, determining the different uh, sets of parameters, uh, usually named the mean, the med, the max, that minimize uh, or maximize the fluxes of cosmic rays that you get depending on the values of the parameter that you choose. So here is a, an example from a rather recent paper from last year on which we worked, in which you see that uh, the fluxes of antiprotons that we are discussing uh, before, actually these are the antiprotons that we are discussing before, have uh, a shape after propagation that resembles the one that we saw at the production with an uncertainty which is uh, uh, added on top due to this propagation part in the galactic environment. So in, in particular in this uh, work here, what we did was to improve the determination of these parameters uh, because of the new data and new, new modeling and be able to reduce the uncertainty by a factor of two with respect to all determinations, which are these uh, gray, gray bands. But still you see that you have uh, almost half an order of magnitude uncertainty under which you cannot uh, uh, shrink uh, much more because of the uncertainty in the astrophysical time. So as I was saying, uh, astrophysics gets in the way. And so our clean picture of uh, fluxes uh, from uh, dark matter annihilation is a bit uh, contaminated by the fact that uh, first, we don't know how dark matter is distributed in the galaxy. And so the abundance and the profile of dark matter will matter in the normalization. More dark matter means more annihilation and so more higher flux and the other way around, of course. The propagation, as I said, changes <clears throat> a bit the shape of the, um, of, the, of the bell and also the normalization, as you saw in the previous slides. And so this also is degenerate with the choices of primary channels and the, and the, and the cross-section. And finally, we have the problem that we don't know exactly how the background from astrophysics looks. And so looking for this bump becomes more, and more or less difficult depending on what you are what you're looking for. So you immediately understand that if you're looking for a nice bump on top of a very well-known power law background, it will be easy to do. But if your background has something like this, uh, looks something like this, then it becomes more complex uh, and uh, things, uh, things become complicated uh, very, very soon. So the background indeed is an important issue. And so let me spend 30 seconds uh, on the one for antiprotons. Uh, because indeed it determines a lot uh, what you derive in terms of the properties of dark matter at the end of the, at the, end of the day. The background, uh, so the astrophysical uh, um, production of antiprotons in the galaxy essentially is due to this, uh, oversimplifying is due to this phenomenon, high energy cosmic rays coming from outside the galaxy and from inside the galaxy, essentially protons or helium, 
heat the gas in the galaxy, essentially hydrogen or helium again. And among the many spallations that they do, they produce also flux, also a spectra of uh, antiprotons. Anti so this is the background of antiprotons that we get from uh, ordinary phenomena in, uh, say, astrophysical phenomena such as uh, these, uh, these spallations. And so there are many ingredients uh, that go into this computation here, in particular, the spectrum of the primary protons or helium, the spallation cross sections for producing uh, antiprotons, uh, say, from uh, proton uh, impinging on, he on hydrogen, proton on helium, and so on and so forth. Then the propagation in the galaxy, because these antiprotons are also subject to the same propagation that I just described. And finally, <clears throat> solar modulation, which tells you how these fluxes are modified when they enter the heliosphere of the sun that I had depicted uh, before uh, here. So these, uh, this background for, for antiprotons has recently been uh, recomputed uh, using uh, uh, data from AMS, uh, the, the experiment installed on, the, on top of the International Space Station, and has been shown to be quite different, I mean, a bit different with respect to uh, people who were expecting before. In particular, these uh, dispersion cross sections are a crucial ingredient which has been reevaluated recently and it's still being reevaluated. And so, let's say, things uh, might, might change uh, in, in the future. So with all these ingredients, uh, let's try to wrap up and uh, derive uh, properties uh, of dark matter. In particular, derive uh, the constraints uh, that we can put from the observations of antiprotons uh, on uh, the, the, the dark matter contribution uh, to the flux of antiprotons. So this is what we did <clears throat> in a recent paper, which is, uh, which is uh, listed here in February of this year. Uh, in which essentially we took the data from uh, AMS uh, from 2016, which are in this publication here. These are the black points that you see here. We took uh, the, um, the contribution from the secondaries, uh, which is uh, the blue line here. And we tried to fit in standard matter and see if we get uh, uh, an improvement of the fit uh, or not. So if you look <clears throat> at constraints, so how much dark matter you can put into the game before exceeding the data points with an appropriate statistical procedure, this is what you get. So in the usual plane of the mass of dark matter and the annihilation cross-section here, what we get are bounds of this sort, depending on the primary channel that we use for some given choices of the profile of dark matter in the galaxy and some propagation parameters, which are called big in this case, and resemble one of the plots on one of the tables that I showed uh, before. So you see that uh, the constraints uh, are of the order of the thermal annihilation cross section. So the famous magic number of 3 10 to the minus 26 centimeter cube per second that I mentioned at the beginning, but are not particularly strong because of this bump of this uh, sort of uh, weakening of the bounds that we see that we see here. Anyway, this is the state of the art as far as I know on constraints uh, from antiprotons on the on the on the on the nucleation of dark matter in the in the different channels that I see. Notice right. also. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Marco. Sorry, I just wanted to quick ask. D do I understand right that um, you didn't marginalize over the different propagation models here? No. So this is uh, this is just assuming big indeed, and big is one of the different. Um, so I had here a table where I was mentioning slim. SLIM is one of the possible choices of propagation models. We have a three, and they are in this paper here, if I'm correctly. They're discussing this one here in which I'm not involved. So essentially, SLIM, big and quaint, are slightly different uh, uh, versions of this propagation equation, diffusion loss equation. Right? So with uh, spectral breaks uh, and um, other subtleties, uh, including this equation here. And then we have uh, mean, med, and max, which are sub, uh, say, categories of slim, big, and, uh, and quaint. So this plot that I was showing before is in the context of uh, uh, big, so choosing the big propagation scheme, and uh, uh, marginalizing over mean, med, and max. OK? Uh, I so see. OK. There are sort of two steps. Got it. And and you think that this choice, I, I don't really know the difference between big and slim and stuff. Right. So no, the choice is not, the, the, the impact is not very big. I didn't put the plots here, but you find them in the paper, uh, in an appendix, I think. And, uh, and you, will, you will see that for slim, it's more or less the same. 
And I'm not sure that we computed it for point because it, indeed it's a bit bizarre of a model, but um, but but it's more it's very similar honestly. And big is the most complete of them, so it includes all the ingredients. While slim and quaint are sort of oversimplifications of big, justified but sort of uh, yeah. I see. Perfect. Got it. Thank you. Can I also ask a related question? Like uh, yeah. in the previous slide, you were showing the. Uh, data versus background. Yeah, here. Yeah. Um, so here, the if you are, were to plot this the um, flux of secondaries uh, ranging between mat, a max and min, say, uh, would it be an order two or order three uncertainty band? The or? secondaries, you mean? Eh? The second, the proportion yeah, secondary. of the secondary. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, so it's not, the second the, the the uncertainty on the propagation is not so important for the secondaries. Again, sorry, I removed the plot, but it's less important than for the primaries. So basically you have a, a band around the blue line, say, which is, a, yeah, maybe a factor of two, but not much more than that. Actually, probably less than that. I can show you the plot later if you want. Oh, okay, just uh, because I remember some early papers that came up just after the publication of the data where they were showing a huge uncertainty band. And uh, so, so I was curious to know mostly that. not, well, huge, it depends. So uh, let me see, I have the plot here. No, unfortunately not. So it's, um, you may remember a plot that we had some years ago with a sort of Jamaican band with some exactly. colors, <laughs> with some yeah. colors on top of it. So that, that is the total uncertainty, which is related to propagation, um, solar modulation, uh, cross sections, uh, and uh, the primaries, uh, the flux of the primaries. And that is a sort of large band, not so large, but a large band, probably a factor of a few around this uh, blue line here. The, Uncertainty due to propagation is not sizable for the secondaries. It is important, but not so much. Basically because they are producing the disk and they explore, say, the local environment in some sense. So they're not produced far away from above and beyond, above and below the disk and propagate. But so they are only, produced in the It's more the uncertainties on the spallation cross-section and the solar exactly. modulation. Mm -hmm. those, mo those are more important, but still not at the level of the Large green, uh, large red band that I showed around the dark matter prediction that I showed before. Okay, thanks. I can show you the plot. Anyway. So these are the bounds that we got. Oh, well, sorry, uh, can I ask? Sorry, uh, sure. Uh, in in your previous uh, slide, uh, the I assume the rest of the rest of the oh, no 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 uh, the next slide. No. Yeah, this one. Oh, yeah. Uh, so the, the all the bounds below are, uh, in the bottom are from antiproton, correct? Whereas the green is not. Is is that a lepton? Uh, what, no, what no, is... no. They're all indeed. So I had them comment here, which I skipped. Up, right. So these are all bounds from antiprotons. Both all bounds from antiprotons, and this is the case in which uh, you annihilate into mu plus mu minus. Okay, but still you do produce some antiprotons because of the electroweak corrections that I that I mentioned briefly at the beginning. So you annihilate into mu plus u minus, and you might say, okay, those decay tectonically, and they will get no zero antiprotons, sure. But it may happen that this mu plus mu minus, before decaying in the usual way that we know, they radiate, say, a z. And this is more important, uh, more important the more the, the, the mass of the dark matter is larger, for reasons okay. that I could elaborate. So at uh, 1 TV and more, you can annihilate into mu plus mu minus, and then the mu plus mu minus emit a z, and the z emits a quark anti quark pair, decays into quark anti quark, and those make a proton at the end of the line. And so no. you get a bound from antiprotons also in the case of annihilation into mu plus mu minus. It's mostly curiosity because these bounds don't matter too much. Oh, I mean, you probably constrain a dark matter that annihilates into mu plus mu minus better into gamma rays or into positrons. But why not? Thank you. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Uh, another question. So the bounds here are dominated by annihilations very close to the galactic center. Is this correct? Uh, yes and no. So let's say um, it depends a bit on the energy, uh, but mostly, so let's say we're talking about antiprotons. And so antiprotons uh, propagate in the galactic halo without losing too much energy because they don't, they don't do, they don't do uh, inverse Compton and they don't do Bremsstrahlung and synchrotron. So they can come from the whole area of the galaxy, uh, including from the galactic center. So if you combine the, the, the sources, basically they are coming from a volume, 
a sort of spherical volume which centered around the location of the Earth, where you collect them, which can reach up to the galactic center and maybe a bit beyond. The contribution of the different portion of, the, of this uh, of in, inside this volume it depends at the energy at which you are looking at and depends on the distribution of dark matter. So for a very spiked profile of dark matter, so a lot of the matter at the galactic center, then yes, I believe that uh, especially at low energy, the, the, the flux is dominated by what happens to the galactic, by the relations happening at the galactic center. For a cold profile and at high energy, it's mostly local instead. So okay. there are actually papers studying on this dating back to 2006 or 2007 by Pierre Salati and collaborators. Okay, thank you. Just to ask a related question like topic, uh, do you know how much these bounds vary if you vary your assumption of an NFW gamma equals one halo? Yes, again, I hope, I, let me see if I put that plot. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I didn't put the plot, but I should have it uh, if you want it later. It's in the paper anyway, in this paper here, we, we take a, a core profile and we take a, 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 um, a contracted NFW with gamma 1.26, which is the one that people have considered for the galactic center access. And, uh, and the uncertainty is, actually this was the plot I was showing, the uncertainty is a factor of maybe a few. I can show you the plot if you want. Okay, thanks. So I wanted to stay at the, say, not go very deep into this. Uh, and, um, and I just wanted to show that uh, uh, other people have, um, well, first uh, that uh, there are newer data from AMS uh, from 2021, which we have not included in this paper here in the analysis that I showed before. Why? Because uh, all the other ingredients, so the propagation and the primary, uh, the background and so on, have been calculated using the 2016 data. So uh, we still have to do all the machinery. People have to redo the machinery for the 2021 data. But anyway, we did the first estimate, and as you see, the results are rather robust. So if I move from the old data, blue, to the new data, red, solid red, then more or less the things uh, don't change as much. Other analysis have used the 2021 data, uh, this one and this one, and the results are sort of inconsistent for reasons that we don't understand very well. This is an agreement with us. This other one instead is much more, much more constrained. And I also wanted to compare with other bounds that have been uh, obtained by other people, uh, which are listed here. So you see that the situation is a sort of bit, a bit messy. So as time goes by from 2015 to 2016, and then uh, our current bounds, uh, the constraints uh, shift, shuffle around. Uh, and I mean, they can be as strong as excluding thermal cross-section up to almost one TV, or as conservative as uh, less than uh, 80, 70 GV as we are doing now. So we are still suffering from uh, uncertainties of uh, different sorts, um, including uh, from the propagation that I mentioned, but, but not only. So in the previous slide, depending on whether you're conservative or not, you can entirely remove this uh, dearth and constraints around 100 GV. Is, is this correct? Like when say it again, sorry, say it again, if, if I... I assume the green is the most aggressive of these of these bounds, yeah? The green is uh, computed by De Mauro and Winkler, and uh, it's recent. There is a paper from uh, February last year, I think. They use this new data. Uh, they use a, a, a statistical procedure, which is probably a bit more aggressive than ours. But to be honest, we are not fully sure we understand why they get to such something so constraining. OK, and, and especially the fact that the the, the absence of constraints around 100 GeV is just entirely missing almost. Yes, so this is, a, so this bump, say this uh, uh, open region uh, due to the constraints is what I want to discuss ne next. Okay, perfect. And indeed it's due to a possible excess that people have considered uh, in, uh, in antiprotons. So, so I, I guess I will not for cover much uh, other species, but that's not a problem. So um, the possible excess has been highlighted uh, in several uh, papers, but in particular in this paper here in, from October of uh, a few years ago by Cuoco and, and others, in which they were showing that, uh, indeed you see the shapes which are similar. They were showing that if you add a dark matter contribution, in particular a, a dark matter with a mass of about 80 GV and integrating into say BV bar, with the thermal annihilation cross-section, you improve your fit as you're supposed to see in these plots. So this one is uh, without dark matter, I think, yes. 
uh, yes, and you see that you have some residuals. So this is difficult to see, but it also teaches you that it's not so so easy to do such an analysis. So these are some residuals on top of the of, of the having subtracted the secondaries. And instead, if you add dark matter, which is the dash, the dotted line here, <clears throat> you get residuals which agree with uh, with null. And so what we were finding is that, that there is a best fit point that which corresponds to this uh, dark matter particle here, which normally, uh, formally in their, in their um, analysis has a significance of almost a five sigma. So this uh, at the time uh, was pretty much discussed. There were other papers uh, uh, sort of confirming this. Uh, although there, there were sort of uh, some criticism uh, as well uh, to this kind of analysis, in particular, the fact that the propagation parameters uh, have been determined in these papers here using uh, only proton and helium data and not uh, boron over carbon, which is uh, one of the main observables in ordinary cosmic rays that I was uh, discussing uh, uh, some minutes ago. And also that the analysis, uh, the way you do the statistical analysis matter because you see that uh, if uh, the excess, uh, I mean, if I cut them, in this paper, you see that uh, they were cutting uh, the region of interest at uh, a few GV, 5 GV, if I remember correctly here. If instead they include this uh, grayed out region in the data, then the excess uh, evaporates. So there are subtleties, subtleties hidden into, into the possible details. So this the issue was discussed for a while. And uh, I think that the bottom line right now is that uh, as mentioned in this paper here, the excess does exist, but this, the significance is a law of the order of uh, say one sigma, given all the possible uncertainty. This is in this paper here, where you see that indeed the constraints have uh, this bump around 80 GV because of this uh, excess uh, that you cannot, this best better fit with a bit of dark matter included. This has been reiterated by this paper here from two years, three years ago. Uh, where they recomputed the antiprotons and all the uncertainty bands. So this actually helps uh, with your question. So these are the different uncertainties uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the secondaries, uh, showing that in the end, the residuals are within the band of uncertainty. And in the paper I was mentioning before, we redid a, a sort of a updated analysis <clears throat> using all the new ingredients. And we find that, yes, indeed, if you add that matter with a mass of 100 GV, annihilating into PV bar, you get a better fit, but the significance is never larger than 1.8 sigma. So not much of a fuss about it. Mm -hmm. So antiprotons, so the summary is you can get constraints as I showed before, but unfortunately the situation is still a bit uh, <coughs> subject to astrophysical uh, uncertainties in, by propagation and by other, and by other things. Let me move on, unless there is a question, no comment. Okay, so let me move on to the other species of uh, charged particles, which are positrons. Mm -hmm. So, and let me uh, discuss uh, in uh, one minute, no more, the uh, data at high energy, because this has been discussed at length in the past 10 years, and I really don't want to go through it again. So the data at high energy, so essentially above 10 GV or so, are these, this is a compilation which is more or less updated. So these are data from uh, on the positron fraction. So the fraction of positrons with respect to the sum of electrons for positrons and the total flux of electrons plus positrons. So you know that the notorious uh, uh, rise that shows here is uh, the rise that was uh, identified first by Pamela and then by AMS. So the positrons rise anomalously with respect to what one would expect uh, for the astrophysical background. So the fun of the game in the past 20, uh, say 10 to 15 years has been to fit with the dark matter component this excess, which was not predicted by astrophysical models. And it actually fits well in the sense that uh, the same bump can be seen, hopefully, also in the flux of electrons plus positives. This is what people did for a lot of years in the past, uh, in the past decade, so say. And this is what you get in the end. You need, if you want to interpret these results with dark matter, you need the dark matter, which is leptophilic, so that manipulates mostly into leptons, actually exclusively into leptons to produce positrons, but not into hadrons. Otherwise, you produce too many antiprotons. And we saw that there is not such a big excess in antiprotons. You need the dark matter, which is heavy, so of the order of one TV or more. 
and you need because you want to produce these bumps at high energy and you need to have a, a huge annihilation cross section because you need to produce this uh, big flux that you that you see here so it turns out that you need the dark matter with a mass of say several tvs one or around a few tv and the cross section of the order of uh, 10 to the minus 23 so three orders of magnitude larger than the cosmological one so these are the feats that people derived, including me, in the past years. I'm not going to, dis to discuss uh, these anymore. Just I want to say that these regions are now mostly excluded by other constraints, uh, mostly gamma rays and CMB. And so the intermatter interpretation of the high energy cosmic rays is not particularly interesting any longer, at least if you ask me. There has been a comeback at some point when Hoke announced the data, and it might be interesting, but I'm not going to discuss this uh, too much. Well, actually, one thing I'm going to say, and it is that uh, uh, AMS, so this is a bit just to pick on the AMS collaboration, say. The, so AMS has promised that they're going to uh, settle the issue once uh, and for all, in the sense that uh, uh, if you now include the AMS uh, 2019 data, this is what uh, they are seeing. Which it was not in the previous uh, in the previous plot. So they are seeing something that uh, goes down in this way. And uh, what they say in their papers uh, in their presentations is that uh, by 2024, AMS will provide a definite answer on the nature of the dark matter. Okay, so I'm happy to say that this is not true, at least uh, as far as uh, as I think, because it it will be easy to produce uh, a dark matter model. So they base, they base, they base their, their claim on the fact that uh, if you see a sharp cutoff, it, you, you will be sure that it is dark matter. And if instead you see something which declines uh, rather smoothly, then it can be astrophysics, for instance, pulsars or, or other things. I claim that this is not true. And uh, you can always cook up models of dark matter which have a, a, a decline in the a smoothly declining shape, and you can also cook up models of uh, pools of other sources in which you have a sharp cutoff. So this claim to me is uh, uh, exaggerated, but we'll see what they can do by 2024 and then sort of some of the data points as well. So instead, I wanted to focus on something a bit more, uh, say, recent, which are uh, data from uh, leptons, so essentially from uh, positrons at low energy. So by low energy, I mean, I mean essentially below a GeV. So cosmic rays produced by dark matter annihilations below a GeV. So this is a pretty difficult region to explore because of this. So because of the heliosphere that I mentioned at some point. So low energy cosmic rays, antiprotons and positrons, cannot penetrate inside the heliosphere because they are uh, deflected away by the solar magnetic field and the solar wind. So. GV cosmic rays do not reach us from outside of the heliosphere, from annihilations from dark matter outside of the heliosphere. So basically, we have no handle on what uh, is produced at sub GV at low energy <coughs> regimes uh, from dark matter annihilations. That actually, that's not true in the sense that we do have something, and that is Voyager. So the, the Voyager satellite, the pro probe, has left the heliosphere in uh, 2012, yes. And uh, it has been measuring uh, the flux of electrons and positrons at sub GV energies. And you see them depicted uh, here. So in between uh, a few MEVs and a fraction of a GV. So Voyager doesn't have a magnet, so it cannot distinguish between protons, uh, between positrons and electrons, as instead AMS can do. But they can tell you the total sum and the total sum of the flux is uh, depicted here. So this is showing that indeed at some point in time, as the year goes by, uh, Voyager uh, went into a sort of a, um, quiet constant phase of rate of uh, counts uh, of cosmic rays. And that's when it went outside of the turbulent area of the heliosphere and is uh, probing instead the cosmic rays outside of the, of the sphere of influence of the sun. So people have used this uh, amazing data taken by Voyager at sub GV energies to constrain dark matter. Not the dark matter that I was mentioning before, but dark matter with a mass, which is typically around a GV or less. The first example is uh, uh, this uh, paper by Mathieu Boudot and others, 
in which they consider dark matter that annihilates into E plus E minus. And using the fact that the flux of, dark, of electrons and positrons from dark matter cannot exceed the data by Voyager presented before, then they get an exclusion, which is uh, depicted here, depending on the different choices as usual for the profile and uh, propagation models, A, B, and so on and so forth. So you see that they get very stringent constraints for sub-GV dark matter, which cannot have a, an annihilation cross-section uh, smaller than the, the thermal one. Now, here the thermal cross-section is given just to guide the eye. It's not necessary that these particles of dark matter are produced in the thermal mechanism like WIMPs, but still uh, it's there to say that these constraints are, are pretty strong. So that's uh, an interesting application at low energy for indirect detection of dark matter, like dark matter, say. Another interesting application is that you could constrain dark matter in the form of primordial black holes. So the idea is, as you know, that dark matter could consist of primordial black holes uh, produced in the early universe, and they can have a huge range of sizes. So the mass is determined by when they are produced in this uh, time uh, t. Uh, from 10, 10 to 23 seconds uh, and on. So they have a different, uh, very huge uh, range of masses, which is depicted in this uh, plot here. It can go from say 10 to the 15 grams to up to solar mass and, uh, and, and even more. So a number of constraints apply on this plot and uh, I will not discuss them because there are so many and there are actually experts in the, in the audience on this. So I, I would not be able to cover all of them. Some of them are actually controversial and I have been uh, removed such as these ones here. What I'm going to say is that um, I'm focusing on this region here around the 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 17 uh, grams because primordial black holes with this mass are uh, emitting uh, particles by Hawking evaporation today. So in the present time. So as you know, Black holes, as black primordial black holes, as any primordial as any black holes, evaporate by Hawking radiation with a temperature which is uh, inversely proportional to the mass and with with a rate that is given by this uh, formula here, with a, a search, essentially a, a black uh, a black body spectrum. So by requiring that primordial black holes do not produce too many electrons and positrons due to their evaporation in the galactic halo today, and by comparing with the data by Voyager we can exclude possible uh, populations of uh, primary black holes making up the dark matter. So this is what we did in this paper here. These are the data by Voyager, exactly the same as I mentioned before, but just multiplied by E, e squared. And these are the fluxes of uh, electrons plus positrons, the blue and red lines in different propagation schemes and in different uh, profiles of the, of the dark matter in the galaxy produced by primordial black holes of different masses. So you see that uh, typically a 10 to the 17 gram primordial black hole cannot produce enough uh, electrons and positrons to touch the Voyager data while a 10 to the 16 gram can. And so it will be excluded by uh, the, the Voyager data. So these are the results that we found. Indeed, around the 10 to the 16 to 10 to the 17, the primordial black holes cannot produce, they cannot consist uh, of the 100%, so fraction one of dark matter in, uh, in the halo because of the constraints from, uh, from Voyager. Um, so it's nice to show, to see that uh, once we, when we published this paper, we got uh, essentially two covers by the press release, uh, one by Science and one by Forbes, and they have two completely different uh, takes on the, on the issue. So science says that uh, we actually undermine the idea that dark matter can be these tiny black holes. And Forbes say that we open the door a new way to dark matter, to look for dark matter. So they, they are more positive. I tend to agree more with the science interpretation, but if I get a billionaire that funds uh, the next uh, postdoc, then I'm happy with Forbes as well. So later, many other constraints have been uh, uh, found in the same region, as you can see here. So these are our Voyager constraints. And now there are constraints which are more uh, stringent uh, of about, uh, say, half an order of magnitude due to different probes uh, that I'm not going to discuss, such as uh, uh, the MEV diffuse gamma rays uh, or the CMB or the determination by edges at uh, the 29 centimeter line and so on, um, absorption and so on. So that's another example of how you can use uh, uh, positrons to constrain dark matter, now in the form of uh, primordial uh, black holes uh, or in the form of sub-GV particles. And, uh, 
and, and instead, before I talked briefly about how you can interpret possible excesses in the electrons and positrons in terms of dark matter. Let me move to the next uh, topic, which are uh, gamma rays. But I think I will be brief on this, and I will just say <clears throat> a, a couple of words. So gamma rays essentially, uh, again, give constraints on one side and possible excesses on the other side. The constraints are essentially coming from dwarf galaxies. And here I'm not saying anything new, especially to people working uh, there. So these are the data from Fermi uh, on uh, dwarf galaxies from 2015. And these are, I think, the most updated ones, uh, including the, the a combination with the other Cherenkov telescopes. Uh, so Hells, Magic, and Veritas, and Hawk. As far as I know, this is still preliminary. I might have missed the, the, the actual publication. So you see that dark matter, depending on the channel in which you annihilate, is constrained for a thermal cross section uh, of, uh, with a mass of the order of uh, 150 or 200 GeV, depending again, uh, again on the mass. So these are typically the most stringent constraints that you get on dark matter, sort of similar to the, to the antiproton ones that I showed before, but slightly more, uh, more stringent on the whole uh, range of masses. Constraints. On the other side, you have also excesses, and that's the very famous uh, galactic center GV excess, uh, which is sort of depicted in these plots here. So I'm not to, I'm not going to discuss this um, as, again because it's probably very familiar to you. It's just the claim that if you look at the Fermi data in energy energy window around uh, say a few GV, ten to uh, ten to um, two to ten uh, GV. If you don't include any dark matter, so without an NFW profile for dark matter, you get a residual. While if you do include dark matter, you get zero residuals or sort of residuals go away. And so, you, and so you can interpret this in terms of additional dark matter in your, in your templates, right? So dark matter interpretation is uh, by now very well known. It's, uh, um, it's, uh, it, it, I mean, the excess can be fit by a dark matter with, say, an, a, a mass of around 35 uh, GV, roughly speaking, uh, annihilating into quarks and with a thermal annihilation cross section. You see that the, in this famous, pa famous paper by a few years ago, they can get uh, the excess, they can fit the excess very well with a very nice uh, uh, statistical significance. Or you can play with different channels uh, <coughs> and move around slightly the value of the mass and the annihilation cross section. So, it's important to, to understand that when this came out a few years ago, this was very exciting and it is still very exciting because from the particle physics point of view is as good as, as good as it can get in the sense that these properties are exactly what you would expect from say vanilla wimp dark matter. So that's why people got excited and thought that this was a, a, a sort of a interesting, a very interesting direction for dark matter to, to, to show up. Now, People looked at the possible compatibility with constraints from antiprotons, which I discussed before. And the conclusion still holds that the antiproton constraints are not conclusive. You saw that there are some bumps before in which this region can still fit. Nor the gamma ray constraints are. So the, 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 the dwarf constraints that I showed before cut through the region of the excess and do not exclude it, not, nor confirm it uh, in, in a new, univocal way. And nor the CMB constraints coming from the energy injected in the CMB from these annihilating dark matter particles, because again, the best fit region is uh, cut into between uh, by, the, by the constraints from the, from the CMB. So of course, uh, this could be dark matter or this could be uh, Another astrophysical interpretation, such as in particular unresolved point sources, so a number of, for instance, millisecond pulsars located around the center of the galaxy, which cannot be resolved by Fermi individually, but that collectively uh, give a diffuse flux, which is uh, wrongly attributed to dark matter. This was uh, the interpretation, the, the most common interpretation a few years ago. Recently, it has been uh, put into doubt possibly by this paper here by Tracy's data and collaborators, and then recently reaffirmed by Nick Rod and, and others. So this is a story that is still, uh, still developing, as you probably know even better than me there. So let me uh, jump to, um, let's see, how am I doing with time? I have a couple of more minutes. Yeah, okay. so go ahead. We already asked okay. a few questions, yeah. Okay, so uh, maybe, uh, 
I will skip a part on uh, on low energy uh, gamma rays because it's uh, it's a bit long. Let me just focus on um, uh, two very last things. One is uh, anti deuterons, and it's uh, and it's here. So it's interesting to look for another kind of uh, charge cosmic rays, which are anti deuterons coming from dark matter annihilations. And the story is very simple. So if you have a dark matter annihilating in the galactic halo. It can produce also a pair every now and then a pair of an anti-neutron and an anti-proton, right? And this, if these nucleons are close enough, they can coalesce and form an anti-deuteron nucleus or anti deuterium uh, in this way. So this happens as as long as they are close in moment in phase space. So they are basically pointing in the same direction, and their their, their speed, say, is more or less the same. So this is given by this formula here that tells you that basically the spectrum of anti, the anti deuterons that you get is given by the spectrum of anti protons times the spectrum of anti neutrons times a coalescence coefficient, coalescence, coalescence, which we contains a, a parameter called the coalescence momentum, which is uh, roughly given by this uh, by this value here. So apart from the details, uh, it's uh, uh, it's interesting uh, to uh, model this uh, uh, with Monte Carlo, so for instance, with Pitya, as we did before, to get the predictions of fluxes from dark matter, uh, from dark matter annihilations. And why is that interesting? Well, essentially because uh, the, the, the result of the simulations is that the, in this uh, plot, uh, which is uh, in this review here, they show, uh, it's actually well known, that uh, uh, the flux from dark matter here in the blue case for different kinds of dark matter, peaks in a different regime with respect to the secondary uh, from astrophysics. So the anti-deuterons, uh, for the way they are produced in spallations in astrophysics, uh, in, uh, in the background, say, have a typical energy which is higher than the one of uh, the dark matter produced one because of the kinematical way of the, of the process. So the idea is that if you see an anti-deuteron with uh, an energy, say, below a GV, roughly speaking, you are performing a sort of background-free experiment because the, the, the background that you expect from astrophysics is order of the magnitude below. And so it would be very interesting to get uh, one of these. There are a few experiments which are trying to look for this. One is AMS, as uh, that I mentioned before as well. And the other one is GAPS, which is dedicated to that, and which is actually uh, flying, uh, I think, uh, next Antarctic summer, so in a few months. GAPS will try to trap one of these anti deuterons inside the, the body of the experiment, and then this anti deuteron will slow down, be captured, and form an exotic atom, and then annihilate into pions and uh, soft gamma rays that will be detected by the, by the silicon tracker inside the experiment. And so, if we see something there, we'll have a very clear, sign clean signature. And it will be in a region where you don't expect very much of a background from, uh, from astrophysics. That would be interesting, but even more interesting is the possibility of detecting anti-helium. And with this, I will really finish. So anti-helium is even more exotic, but can be produced by dark matter annihilations in the galaxy. So the idea is that, again, you produce now a triplet of nucleons, antiprotons and two antineutrons, and they coalesce, forming tritium that then decays into uh, antihelium. You can also produce it directly with two antiprotons and antineutrons, but this would be anti Coulomb suppressed. And you can try to produce also antihelium three, uh, four, sorry, but this is statistically suppressed because you need uh, four of the nucleons to coalesce uh, together. So clearly the yield is very much suppressed. But it will be very interesting if we ever see something. So a few years ago, we computed the possible yield of anti-helium from dark matter annihilations, and we're finding something like this. So for this specific choice of parameters, the background from astrophysics sits here, and the prediction from dark matter sits here, which is very interesting because it's, again, in a background-free region. But it's orders of magnitude below the reach for AMS. So we did that for a number of possible cases, and in all cases, almost all cases, we're finding yields that are very much below the sensitivity of AMS. What is exciting is that a few years ago, AMS instead claimed that they had collected a few events compatible with being anti-helium, so with the charge plus two. 
In 2016, they said that they had a few events with their mass around helium-3. And then in 2018, that became eight events, two of which are helium-4, and uh, six of which are possibly helium-3 in seven years of data taking. So after that, I didn't hear anything uh, more. But if this is confirmed, so if AMS has seen some anti-helium, then this will claim for sure for some uh, very exotic production mechanism, possibly dark matter, or some astrophysical uh, possible exotic production. So let me skip the different interpretation that the people gave. Let me conclude with this. So these are all the bounds that I know on uh, dark matter indirect detection, some of which I discussed and some other which I, I did not discuss. So in the very familiar plane now of dark matter mass and annihilation cross-section, this is the status I think updated right now. The thermal cross-section is here and you recognize here the bounds from the dwarfs, which are dominant ones at uh, say rather low mass. The bounds from antiprotons, which are this dashed line that, uh, that is seen here. The bounds from the CMB, which I did not discuss, and the bounds from neutrinos, which are up here, which I also uh, did not discuss. This is the status. This, port, this portion of the parameter space is still open, and this portion instead is, of course, excluded. So my conclusions are just words, and are that dark matter has not been seen yet, unfortunately, of course that we can try to detect it with cosmic rays, which are in principle a very powerful tool, but they have their own little problems. So as I said, in positrons, we have a long-standing uh, high energy excess, the Pamela rise, and some chances at low energy, say with Voyager, for instance. Antiprotons are important, but still have large uncertainties. Uh, the the anti-deuteron has a challenging flux, but hopefully we will detect something at some point. And anti-helium, as I said, would have been hopeless, but instead AMS might, might hide any surprise. So all these channels are difficult in some way or another. So the solution would be, at least in my opinion, to, uh, to adopt a multi-messenger approach in which you look for excesses in different channels. And if one confronts the other, then it's something uh, to be excited about. Otherwise, uh, single excesses come and go. OK. Sorry, I, I'm done. It's a bit long. No so. Thanks a lot, Marco. And um, thanks a lot for the very uh, nice overview and the um, and the updates and recent results. And are there questions from the from the audience? Yeah, if you could say about uh, the the theories with for anti helium axis. Yes, so uh, so here they are. <clears throat> so the, the, the easiest thing, if you want, is uh, to try and push the coalescence mechanism to large uh, parameters. So in a boost, say, the coalescence momentum, as I showed before. And this has been tempted, uh, this, uh, attempted in this paper here, in which they showed that if you adopt uh, a very large value for the for the coalescence uh, momentum, then you can get something which gets more or less into the sensitivity of AMS, which is uh, which is here. Mm -hmm. So this is something that we also had tried. I'm not too much convinced on this, but let's say it's one of the possibilities. Uh, from dark matter, uh, um, Profumo and collaborators have uh, tried to obtain this, uh, say, a few events from of anti helium from dark matter. And they find that possibly again, playing again with the parameters, you can get something which is compatible with the constraints from uh, uh, null searches for antiprotons and, uh, and uh, antideutrons. More uh, exotic say is that the possibility that, uh, which I've been proposed in this paper here, that uh, this anti-helium could, co could come from clouds of uh, antimatter or anti-stars. However, honestly, to make this work, uh, you need uh, to engineer the, 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 the model uh, a lot, in particular because you need to fix BBN in some sort, in some sense, otherwise uh, you, you screw it up completely. And then the last thing I know about this is this paper that uh, has uh, produced, uh, uh, proposes to produce anti-helium from uh, an exotic model in which you have uh, an anti, uh, an, um, 
a particle phi that decays exactly into a negative value number that you need. And it's finely it tuned in terms of masses in order not to be killed by the antiproton constraints. Basically, you can produce only antiprotons, only anti helium, but not antiprotons for kinematical reasons. So, all of this is very exciting because, indeed, if you see an anti helium somewhere, it will certainly be a signal of something exotic, whether dark matter or some say, exotic, crazy ideas like these ones here. However, First of all, we should consider that uh, this claim is out since a few years and we haven't seen nothing so far. So let's wait for the, for the, for the actual announcement. We know the energies of those. Yes, they are rather, they are rather um, high energy. So I forgot exactly, but I mean, they, they are not saying much, but they say that uh, at least one of them uh, has an energy Per nucleon, a kinetic energy per nucleon, which is uh, around one GV, so somewhere around here, if I remember correctly, on these plots. Mm -hmm. But I mean, this is all, these are all rumors. Huh? Yeah. Well, not rumors because it's uh, something himself that uh, presented the results at the colloquium in CERN, say in this case, but nothing more specific as far as I know. What what is it? Maybe I missed if, if you said it. What is it that makes the dark matter spectrum? Uh, peak in a different place than the Bauer. Really, I should say, what does so, it make the background peak up there? Yeah, it's, it's the same reason for, for anti neutrons. And um, it's basically so it's not difficult to see on a piece of paper, it's kinematics. So basically, <clears throat> uh, the background is produced by a high energy cosmic rays that impinges on a, a nucleus, uh, say, gas at rest. And so, if you do the, the kinematics, uh, that turns out to give you a lower threshold of the energy that the produced antiprotons can, uh, the produced anti-helium can have. So basically when you do this process, high energy over steel gas, you cannot get too slow anti-helium. There's always uh, say with a kinetic energy higher than uh, one GV per nucleon roughly. If instead you are annihilating dark matter particles uh, and you produce uh, say fluxes of uh, anti-nucleons uh, at a slow enough, uh, momentum, then you coalesce and you can have a slow anti-helium at the end of the line. So it's just kinematics. Got it. Perfect. Thanks. Um, I have a very naive question. Um, so you, I think you're assuming there are um, dark matter and anti-dark matter annihilation and you're looking for the product. What, why, are, why do you expect there to be so much anti-dark matter left? Uh, so the, the, the assumption here is, the, is that, um, it, I mean, it's a possible assumption. Of course, it's not uh, the only one. The assumption is that uh, dark matter and anti-dark matter are equally abundant. So there is a symmetric abundance of dark matter and anti-dark matter. Right? And that's uh, sort of, say, the zeroth order assumption in most of the, in most models. There are, of course, models in which you have instead asymmetric dark matter. So only a dark matter exists and dark matter doesn't exist any longer, exactly as it happens in a baryonic matter. So due to, right, so to the uh, unbalance between matter and antimatter, all the antimatter gets annihilated away and what's left is matter. Mm -hmm. The same could happen also for dark matter. Mm -hmm. So you could have models, you actually have classes of models in which you have only dark matter particles and not anti-dark matter particles. But if you want to look for signals uh, in indirect detection, say with some uh, caveats, but typically what you need is uh, annihilations. And so dark matter and anti-dark matter equally present in the galaxy and, and, and annihilating away one with against the other, right? So the, the other thing that maybe, maybe I didn't say is that, uh, so these residual annihilations that happen today in the galaxy are so weak that the yield is possibly enough to see them, but they don't deplete the dark matter in the galaxy at all, right? So the, 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 the typical cross-section that we are talking about is so low that it's not that we are emptying the galaxy of dark matter. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, I also had another quick question about the antiproton uh, possible excess. Um, the fact that there is also some, I mean, if I look at the bound, um, uh, there were some actually deficiencies of antiprotons that looked right just before and just after the bump. 
So it could suggest the idea that maybe if one wants to think about uh, astrophysical explanation, there is some unaccounted acceleration mechanism that uh, uh, affects the distribution of you, the... You mean here? Like oh, in this block the next plot, statement? actually. Yeah, for example, yeah. Or mm -hmm. there was another one that was even more apparent later. Yeah, or even here, actually. Yeah, the fact that there is... Um, so the bound is actually pretty strong at, uh, say, a few hundred, few dozens and a thousand uh, GV yes. compared to the... Yeah. yeah. So exactly. this uh, The fact that here the bound uh, goes up and relaxes is precisely due to the fact that uh, I can fit uh, some dark matter in here, in this uh, little space that is uh, above the data point uh, here, you see? Sure, but I, I mean, uh, is there a slight, uh, like aren't the data slightly going beyond the expectation at, before this bump at lower energies? There was another paper, another plot that you were showing later, uh, which was hinting at this. This one here? No. For example, um, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm not completely, let's say. So uh, suggesting with the idea that you could be shifting some protons to a higher uh, energy beam because of some, maybe some. Ah, I see. Uh, well, I have to think about this. I'm, I'm not completely sure it could work, but I don't know. Yeah. Okay, no, it was just something that came to mind. And maybe a, a last somewhat related question is uh, was about the uncertainties in the spallation cross-section that is then one of the main uncertainties on the antiproton side um yeah. so the Let what are the ways to... in which we can try to uh to better understand it or constrain it and could it be in some lab experiments or can we calibrate it with uh uh, protons, for example, or yes. So let's... let me let me just uh, show this uh, slide since I have it here now. Uh, am I sharing again? Steven? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so yes. this is the this is the the, um, the uncertainty bound that there was band that there was mentioned at some point. So Jamaica colors in some sense. Yeah. Actually, it's more the Kenya flag, but anyway, uh, the 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 uncertainty due to uh, propagation is the yellow thing, which you see accounts for a part of it, but not, uh, but not much. And by the cross-section is uh, the uh, red one, which is uh, actually rather dominant, especially uh, here at uh, intermediate uh, energies, which is where the excess actually shows. Don't look at the data here because these are all data and stuff. But, uh, and so your question is how you, we can uh, improve the uncertainty on the cross-section, right? Yeah. So basically with, uh, with collider experiments. So uh, people are analyzing the, uh, data from uh, NA62 and Brahms uh, and other collaborations of the sort that what they do is uh, shoot, posit uh, shoot protons uh, towards a, a target and see how many antiprotons come out. And this helps to understand these cross sections. I'm oversimplifying enormously what they do, of course, but from a theorist point of view, this is what they do. And so from a laboratory experiments, you can have a handle on the, on, on the yield and the cross section of production of antiprotons uh, in the lab as you have in the say, dark disk. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have one, one very basic question about, about like broadly the inter indirect detection uh, mm. program, which is what property is generically should dark matter possess that you would first see something in indirect detection rather than direct detection? Uh, well, let's say it should certainly annihilate, right? And that's uh, that's something that you, well, not necessarily in the sense that you have also signals from decay, but let's say, um, and um, I don't know if there is a let's say, in terms of uh, in terms of uh, um, practicalities, say, it turns out that most of the searches that we have in uh, indirect detection are geared towards typical WIMP particles, right? So it helps a lot if dark matter has a mass of the order of uh, say hundreds of GeV and higher, because the background from astrophysics typically goes down as the power low, as you saw, and because the, instead the signal from dark matter is much more visible and clean. While in direct detection, typically heavier particles are hopeless. I mean, you cannot see them because they're occurrence in direct detection experiments goes down as their inverse over their number. 
the fewer there are, fewer scatterings. In indirect detection, the heavier the mass, the better at some point, in some sense. And so the, the strength of, uh, say, the, the, the value of uh, indirect detection is that it can probe more easily masses, uh, say, even TV and beyond, even multi TV and uh, up to even hundreds of TV. Then at some point, you need the theoretical constraints, uh, theoretical prejudices, say, the unitarity bound and so on. But you can even go a bit beyond that. So I would say that the, the, the strength of indirect detection is uh, being able to probe uh, a large range of masses uh, around the TV and beyond, which is typically not accessible to colliders, of course, and to direct detection. But there are many, many caveats that uh, makes it difficult to have it. Thank you. And actually, just to, just to finish, so let's say, if you work really in the regime, in the mindset of uh, uh, purely say we WIMP particles. Uh, it turns out, so recently people have explored a, a number of mechanisms such as a uh, bound state formation and uh, the Sommerfeld enhancement before and then bound state formation and, and do two things combined and so on that pushes you towards, uh, naturally towards heavier dark matter. So in some sense, uh, WIMPs uh, with a mass of 100 GV are in trouble because of the reasons we know we didn't discover at the LHC and so on, but are also out of fashion in some sense because in the past few years we understood that these processes I was mentioning push you towards multi TV rather more naturally than a than few tens of GeV. And so indirect detection still has to play a role uh, there as far as I know. That's what I think. Thank you. So me, I will stop the recording and we can stay another moment for if you want to chat a second more. So let's thank again, Marco. Thank you.